So um, the slides I want to show it to you, um, I sent a link to David. They're also on um, uh, speakerdeck.com forward slash El Collado T-U-O-R. Um, but I um, um, want to use the, the Google slide version because it has so many animations. Um, and so I just put this slides together today in the morning. Um, but because um, uh, uh, the idea is to make this session a bit more like practical. Um, so this is really just a guide with some links and things like that. So what I'm going to talk to you about is about uh, how to make R and bioconductor packages using a package that I made called BioCidness. And I'll mention recount tree as an example use case. Um, um, so why do you want to make R functions, right? That's the very first step. We're not even talking about packages yet. Um, why do you want to make those? So you want to avoid uh, copy paste errors. Um, that's one big reason why you're, uh, you'll start using R functions. Um, another one of them is you want to facilitate maintenance of your code. So let's say you have the same code in like five different parts of your script um, and you notice you need to make a change, then you need to make five changes. And so instead of you have a single function, then you only need to edit your code in one location. Um, and then once you start having functions, these are going to basically become like building blocks for you know expanding your universe. Um, um, and um, there's actually a full. We, we did two full sessions on on a set of slides um, from uh, Charlotte Wickham and um, and um, Hadley Wickham. Uh, from the Building Tidy Tools workshop that, uh, let me just open that link. Um, and so, um, on this tweet, you'll find a link um, um, to a, a document, a Google document that then has a link for downloading the slides that I uh, talk about in that video. Um, uh, here, like the Leo, Leo Dropbox link. Um, so um, just to quickly show you some of that, let me open, um, just to give you a, a little bit of an example of why like functions are good. Let me just find you. Um, um, uh, an example. Um, sorry, I forgot to load these before. Starting. So they, they have a great example on their on these slides uh, about like copy paste errors. Um, um, Right. So like, really like, uh, this, is a, this is a common scenario where you have something uh, that you're doing for one column and then you copy paste that um, code. Um, and I don't know if any of you can notice the mistakes there. I think one of them is minus 98 instead of nine, minus 99. Yes, that's, that's a great eye over there. Yeah, and then there is like a um, dollar, like the, not the last um, line, the one before. I think you are assigning J instead of I. Exactly, yeah. So those are two errors there. And here they're highlighting in red in this next slide. So, um, but like, this can be really hard to, you know, to notice when you're running your code because um, both lines of code are actually uh, valid R lines, right? So R won't give you an error and you might not even notice that you have this actual mistake until um, later on, like, let's say you make a plot or something and you're like, oh, why does this plot look weird, right? Um, so, uh, 
So one way you can get around this is to actually uh, write a little function here that you know, does this, the step that you're doing. So in this case, we're like looking at a column, finding all the values that are minus 99 for that column and assigning an A. And so by doing that, now you have you know, a little function that you can copy paste, but you're still copy pasting and you might still make errors in this scenario. Um, and so uh, if you look at all these lines of code, you'll notice that there's, a, there's an issue still here where we're assigning the i-th column to the h column. Um, um, so you, you can still make mistakes. And so uh, there's a solution there which involves like, okay, you can make a for loop to loop through your function. Um, or you could use like functional programming tools. So I won't go more into that, um, but you can kind of get an idea here of how useful functions are for avoiding errors. And for, uh, um, uh, again, like I said, like, uh, uh, this also makes it easier to update your code. So if you notice now that instead of, it, uh, instead of um, the missing value being minus 99, maybe now it's like minus 98, you only need to edit one piece of code, one, one line of code instead of, I don't know how many we had, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine lines of code. Um, um, so that's, um, that's how functions can be quite useful and powerful. And uh, I mean, and, um, we can go more into, into um, there's like full lectures on why functions are useful, right? Um, but that's the basics of it, there's three points. Um, avoiding copy paste, facilitating maintenance, and expanding your universe. But now, now let's say you're, you know, you're, you bought into the idea of making our functions. Uh, why do you actually want to write an R package, right? Um, so these, you know, you know, once you have functions, you maybe want to organize them. And so uh, R packages are, um, uh, uh, they're really like a set of rules for structuring your files. Um, and so uh, they help you organize your functions. Um, there's also like a lot of tools out there that will help you um, actually test your code. Um, and so that can also be quite useful. Um, um, and they, they will run some automatic tests for your functions. And you can also build more tests using, for example, the test that package. And you can check how many how well tested your package is using the cov r package, for example. Um, um, or you can use like r command check, which is a, um, a native r command for running a bunch of little checks on your package, right? Uh, and making sure that your code is well organized. Um, um, then there's also the bioconductor checks, uh, which are more specific um, to bioconductor. Uh, but ultimately, like another big reason for making our packages is that it allows you to share your code. Um, it also allows you to document it. Um, and so uh, you'll, notice, you'll start to notice, okay, these are you know, maybe things that we want to do, but they get more and more complicated as we move along, right? Um, writing our function you, uh, involves like simply like learning about the function. Um, the function is called function, right? <laughs> and like uh, curly braces and stuff like that um, using arguments. Uh, right in our package, um, you start to notice a bunch of new terms, right? Like R command check and things like that. Um, so it can, it can be a little bit daunting. Um, um, but uh, I mean, it can be quite rewarding because once you start sharing your code, then other people can use it. And like, it can be as simple as using, for example, this remote install GitHub command. Um, or a more complicated like biasy manager install command um, and other commands. So um, let's say you're okay, you started working on your R package, right? Then why do you want to go to Biconductor, right? Like this is, if we, if we keep going uh, um, uh, up this hill, right? Biconductor is pretty high up on that hill of making packages and sharing code. Um, but one of the reasons though is that you want to reach the top of that hill is that you want to have a quality standard, right? And Biconductor um, has a peer review system um, um, and only packages that pass a peer review process 
are allowed to be distributed through by a conductor. Um, and so this gives you like um, a confidence or a brand uh, tag that like you can then tell your other users like, okay, my package is, you know, a list of this level of quality. Um, and so maybe they'll be more inclined to, to use your package. And if they use your package, maybe then they cite your paper and eventually, you know, you get enough citations, you get a job or you get promoted or things like that. Um, yeah, um, um, I mean, that's part of what we're doing. Uh, it's also an open source community uh, by conductor. So um, really by being part of that community, then you'll get free help from others. Um, and that's quite useful. If you don't have anyone around, you can ask for help. Um, and so, uh, like now, nowadays, I guess we're using Zoom and Slack quite a bit. Um, and, and there's other like support forums and things like that. But um, at some point, you might run into very specific R problems. Um, and here you can get access to, uh, to like R core members, for example. Um, and or bioconductor core members that uh, are maybe professional or R programmers and um, uh, will be able to help you a lot faster than than other people. Um, now, um, uh, if you submit a package to buy to buy a conductor, you also get a dig digital object identifier. Um, there's other ways of doing this. For example, through Zenodo. Um, um, but basically this gives you something that people can cite on papers, right? Um, although really like one of the reasons why we submit packages to Black Conductor ourselves is that it helps when publishing, right? Um, uh, we can then say on our paper like, oh, and, and the software that we made for this paper is now publicly available through Black Conductor. And you know, that's a name now that people recognize in bioinformatics and they, you know, they know that it, it has a certain quality level to be there. Um, and so the uh, reviewers, they might be more inclined to accept the paper because, because the software is like of, um, of decent quality. Um, now, um, as a developer yourself, maybe you also want to submit your package to Biconductor because they, will ha they have the funds to run tests automatically every, every day on Mac, Linux, and Windows. And that's a lot of work that you not, don't necessarily want to be doing. Um, and, but it's useful work because that's how you can detect errors before your users run into them. Um, and so, um, uh, you're interested in making a piece of software that's really going to be used by the community, then, uh, uh, Biconductor will make it easier on you to actually provide that quality level of software. So this is really like we're top, at the top of the hill now, I mean, we, we understand now how the hill looks, but we're still like at the bottom of the hill, right? We're still starting. Sorry, the, sorry there. Could I, yeah. could I interrupt and ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, um, what's your opinion on bioconductor versus CRAN? Uh, like, I guess you also at some stage have the op op option to submit your package onto CRAN, which I understand also has some level of kind of quality maintenance. Um, what's kind of the, the advantage of going for Bioconductor over CRAN? Um, yeah, so, um, so CRAN also has a quality check process. Uh, it's not as much as a peer review, but more as a, as a basic quality check. Um, so in the Bioconductor peer review process, they actually check whether there's already another package that is very similar to the one you're proposing, for example. Um, and um, uh, at CRAN, they won't necessarily do that. Um, now, uh, CRAN runs uh, tests on your package at the moment that you submit them. Um, they don't have the resources to, to, to test your package every single day. So that's one big difference there. Um, uh, but then like uh, CRAN um, um, is quite general um, and the degrees of quality uh, uh, for our packages in CRAN is quite variable. Um, mm -hmm. um, in Bioconductor, for example, they require that you have a, what's called a vignette document for your package, which is a document that explains how the different functions in your package play together. And that's not a requirement from, for CRAN. Um, 
But that vignette document is really like the main document for users for understanding how to use your package. And so, um, uh, like Biconductor has a bit more of a, a requirements towards a user friendliness. Now, there's something else that I that Young Cran and Biconductor um, is called R Open Sci. Um, 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 R Open Sci stands for R for Open Science, um, and they play along with Cran. So the idea is that you can your package can be on Cran. They don't actually distribute the package, our open side. Um, uh, um, um, but what they do is that uh, they peer review code from others, right? And help others uh, improve the quality of their code. Um, mm -hmm. um, and so they're, they're trying to improve, let's say, CRAN. Uh, 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 but they're still like playing with some of their rules, right? Um, um, Bioconductor is, um, was started, you know, before all of this. Also, um, uh, Bioconductor was founded by Robert Gentleman, which is one of the two authors for R. Um, mm -hmm. And he, you know, he wanted a, a place where people could share, um, Code that is quite useful for open uh, for high throughput um, biological data. That was his main focus initially. Right? Um, sure. uh, so there's still like you know there's uh, quite a bit of differences uh, between CRAN and Bioconductor. Um, and in my case, I mostly work on like you know, high throughput biology data, um, data analysis. So that's why I've only really um, submitted packages to Bioconductor. Um, but um, um, uh, CRAN is still like uh, a higher standard than like sharing your code on GitHub. There's still like a um, like some commitment um, uh, that goes on from the developer side uh, once they share their code through CRAN versus just sharing it on GitHub. Um, so, uh, I mean, CRAN does a lot, and without it, like the R community would be not as good. Um, uh, but like. For for our field, I would say Bioconductor is the best, like the the the, the best quality standard we can uh, we can aspire for. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I guess in theory you could have a package that is uh, approved by Bioconductor and our open side too. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. That way you're part of multiple open source communities and get help from multiple people. Right. Yeah. It just might have a slightly different view sometimes. Um, how to do things so you know we're we're like you know we're we're on this valley and we're looking up this hill there's a lot of things that we can learn or you can start uh like you for example start the bioconductor package guidelines um i won't open this link but you'll see there's a bunch of text there about how to how to make your R package for bioconductor and all the rules you need to follow um um, I highly recommend you have the opportunity to take this Building Tidy Tools workshop um, that uh, when I took it in 2019, it was taught by Charlotte and Hadley Wickham. Uh, they're both our student employees um, at some level. Charlotte, I think, is a part-time R student employee. Um, um, and there's also the R Packages book by Hadley Wickham and Jenny Bryan, um, which is free. You can access it there. Um, but really, like all these things, they're they're gonna end up being like um like long documentation forms about how to make an R package, right? Um, and then they're really, you know they're really good. Um, they can they're filled with details about how to actually make an R package, but it can be overwhelming to like look at through all of that. Um, and let's say like maybe you already have your your package and you want to submit it to Biconductor, then there's a set of rules then for submitting your your package to to Biconductor detail on this website uh, that David I think is a bit more familiar now. Um, so there's a lot of rules and a lot of uh, uh, ways of organizing files but then to make it simpler right um, um, Jamie Bryan and other people developed the use this package which is like a helpful framework for making our packages because um, like yes we can read all the rules of like okay you need to have you know, files one two and three they have to have this very specific format. 
all of that. And then maybe you can find someone else's code, copy paste it, start adapting it. But um, that can you know, lead to errors and, and, um, and it can be a, quite a bit of work. So now with this use this package, there's a function there called create package um, that uh, really, like if you just run that function, you end up having an R package, you know, immediately like two seconds later. Um, and so here I included a link to the documentation website for use this. And actually the, this here I have a screenshot of that create package um, function. I will, I, I'll, I'll use this in, on my demo in a, in a little bit, this function. But you, if you see over here on the right side, it's fairly simple. Like you only need a path argument that says like, um, what is the name of your package and where is it going to live? And then there's a couple other options where you want to use RStudio, whether you want to um, um, open package. Um, so that's for making the package. Now, for actually like developing the package, um, one of the latest technologies is called GitHub Actions. Uh, and um, um, some of you might have, might be familiar with the concept of continuous integration uh, or the name called uh, the name Travis. Um, but I think like uh, GitHub Actions is really like the, the way to go forward. And why do you want to start using this? Well, eventually it's going to really save you time. Because um, when you're, you're developing a package, you need to test your code quite a, uh, and every time you make a change. And that can be time consuming. Um, because, you know, you can run it on your computer and that's how people used to do it. Uh, I mean, that's how I actually did it. Uh, but uh, maybe you're only working on a Mac computer, right? And you don't have access to Windows or a Linux computer. Um, through GitHub Actions, you can actually test your package on Windows, Mac, Linux. And you can even start using something that's called Docker, which is a way of sharing uh, a specific, uh, um, specific configurations of, uh, in Linux um, with like specific software installed. Um, um, and so um, that, you know, all of this is are good reasons for using GitHub Actions. It's also free, uh, which is <laughs> a very important reason for a lot of us. Um, and it's free and uh, if, if I click on this link, um, we'll see that the machines that they are letting us use for free um, have um, two CPUs, seven gigabytes of RAM memory, and 14 gigabytes of disk, which is actually quite decent, right? This um, simulates like a standard laptop, really, uh, for a lot of people. Um, um, and you can use uh, Windows, multiple versions of Linux, and, um, and the latest Mac version. Um, so all of this is quite uh, powerful. Um, and it's quite impressive that they let you use it for free. And they let, it use it, they let you use it for up to six hours for free, which is quite a lot of time and enough time for us to run all our tests and things like that. Um, um, I can go back to presenter mode. Um, then, uh, the Docker uh, component is quite important because it provides you a reproducible framework. Um, and uh, one of the things you'll, you'll learn is if you're making an R package in order to share with other people, um, people will run into problems. They'll run into little bugs and things like that. And sometimes those errors can be um, uh, dependent on the installation of packages that they have. And so you want to have a common ground framework where they can be like, okay, I'm getting this error. And then you can go and completely reproduce that framework on your computer and say like, okay, I'm also getting that same error. Why am I getting that error? And then you as the package author can like uh, dive deep into why you, that error is happening. Right? Um, and otherwise without that reproducible framework, you might spend a lot of time just installing everything on another computer. Um, um, and so uh, I've gotten like, I, I mostly work on a Mac computer and I've gotten like uh, Windows users sometimes in the past asking about problems 
and then you need to find a Windows computer, install everything there, and it can take a while to figure out everything. Um, so Docker is quite powerful for all of this. Um, but actually, we're gonna, I, I like using now the back and after Docker images, but they're really powered by another project called the Rocker project. Um, this one is involves people from our open side, which I mentioned briefly. Um, now the issue with GitHub Actions is that it's also a cutting edge. And uh, maybe that's something you want, maybe that's something you don't want because you're gonna run into the latest R issues that are available out there. Um, and so uh, this is like uh, one of those scenarios that with more power you get more responsibility, right? So uh, the closer you get to the source and to running things with the latest version of R, you might also run into problems there that are, haven't been fixed yet. Um, um, so you might need to figure out how to install some, some dependencies and stuff like that. Uh, but again, uh, if you're part of a community where you can ask these questions, probably someone there knows the answer or can help you find the answer. Um, and um, Jim Hester shown here on the right, he's an employee at our studio a former employee at Bioconductor. Um, he is the first person that, um, that really dove deep into using GitHub Actions for R. And he gave a talk at our studio conference in January 2020, which I would really uh, recommend that you watch. It's like 20 minutes long. Um, um, so, um, so use this, it's quite useful to get started. GitHub Actions is quite useful to then keep developing your package. And so BIOS this comes here because the idea is to, it will help jumpstart the process of making an R or Bioconductor package. Um, and one, is, one of its main features is that it includes a GitHub Actions workload that is Bioconductor friendly. Um, this is, uh, this is, took me quite a bit of time. It took me maybe a month or a month and a half to develop this workflow. Um, um, and at that point, we're, we, we might get really into details about Bioconductor versus R versus like CRAN, for example. But, um, but now, like as a user now of BioCities, you don't actually have to spend any time figuring this out. Um, and so like, here's the help page for that. Um, and I'll, I'll make a demonstration with it, um, with BioCities. Um, and then you can run um, your tests on uh, Bioconductor, Docker, Mac, and Windows. Um, it runs R command, build, check, also BIOS check. Uh, it provides like the code coverage uh, using CovR. It makes an automatic documentation website package, that, package down. Um, and so this is a lot you know, of stuff that takes time to run by yourself and you, you can now do it automatically. Um, BIOS this also has functions that are similar to use this, but that are like specifically tailored for bioconductors needs or actually mine sometimes. Um, um, so one of them, for example, is this uh, used BIOS vignette, which creates a vignette document um, using um, BIOS style. Um, and it has a specific structure of, that I like to use for my own um, documentation. Um, and I, you know, and that I recommend other people use. Um, so um, it's nice that you know all these templates are there, and the idea in the end is to make it easier for you to to make an R package. You want to do this um, without having to spend as much time, like with all the setup. And um, something that I think will, is quite uh, useful for uh, uh, both uh, first-time R package developers, but also like someone like me that has been developing the packages for a while, is that I uh, by see this includes four. Um, development scripts that um, uh, Google Slides is showing on there. But um, those four development scripts will help you, um, uh, they will really guide you in the process of making your package. Um, and uh, they include like all, of, all of the different commands you might be interested in running. Um, so as an example of a, a package that I made using BioCities, there's a recon tree package. Um, um, and so that lives publicly already here on the Liber Institute uh, for slash recon tree GitHub site. Um, and we can look at the documentation website for it. Um, this one was done 
automatically using package down. Um, um, and so we look at this documentation website, like uh, it includes really like a lot of the information a user might be interested in, like how to cite, how to install, how to like um, um, some little tags here saying like, you know, what is the status, um, uh, how much of it is tested. And this is a, a work in progress package. So it's not like fully developed yet, uh, but you can already see, for example, um, the examples for some functions, for example, here I have the one for uh, creating an array summarized experiment object. Um, 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 and so you can already see like, um, like what is it, how do you actually run this function, the arguments, you can see some output of the examples. And these were run automatically. I didn't have to run this myself on my computer, then upload the resulting HTML files to GitHub and have them like publicly available at a point. Um, I can easily make a change here and, um, uh, and update this website. And in particular, um, uh, if we go to the github.com Libre Institute recount tree website, um, you'll notice that GitHub actions here are shown at the very top. There's this, um, uh, I zoomed in too much. There's this uh, option over here that says, um, this tab, sorry, that's called actions. If we click there, we can see the results of all these automatic um, GitHub actions workflow results. And so some of them have an X, that means like there was a problem. Some of them have a, a green check mark, that means that, oh, they worked. And so uh, four months ago, uh, an update I made was working. Then three months ago, I changed something and that broke it. And eventually I made a couple more changes and I fixed it again. Then actually yesterday I made some new edits and it broke. And I can see like, let's, if I look at the latest one, um, um, I can see why it broke. Um, so there's a lot of commands here shown. And, uh, and so I don't need to actually spend all the time running these commands myself on my computer. I can immediately like jump into the log file and find why something failed. And uh, what was it? Um, uh, yeah, here's the error message. Uh, and so that error was uh, from running this example, this mouse example that I have. Um, so actually my computer, I already did this before we started. I like loaded my package and I can run that same example, that same mouse example. Um, and then I can see what, you know, what is the actual error. But I didn't have to run through all my code in my package and see what works, what doesn't work now that I made a change. I can immediately find like, okay, like there's an error, where it is, and then I can start you know, debugging the error on my computer. I haven't had the time to debug it, but I know where it is now. Um, so that's quite powerful there. Um, so um, you can also make uh, other things using GitHub Actions, like you can make a book down website or a full like R markdown website. So I included some links there, for, for examples. And uh, if you want way more examples, I actually made a here little website with all the packages that I've, that I've made. And so you can, you know, you can find a lot more code examples if you want. Um, so at this point, let me demonstrate how this works, how uh, BioCities works. So um, um, you first need to create a package uh, for any of this work. So I'm going to use the use this package, create package. Uh, I'm going to create it on my desktop, uh, and I'm going to call it um, uh, Minadis. Um, and so this is a use this function that I created a bunch of files and, uh, and it's telling me like what are the options used and where it created them. And it is automatically, because I ran this command in our studio, it's automatically um, open a new R studio window for me. Um, um, and so at this point I have a little package called Minidus, but I haven't used BioCities yet. So I'm gonna use BioCities 
uh, uh, use BioC package templates. Um, so let me just make this window bigger so you can see more of it. Um, so what did this do? This function here from BioCDIS actually created the dev directory, the development directory, and it created four scripts inside of it. Um, and so uh, if I go to the first script, the, the one called create package, it has comments and commands here that will guide you through this process. And it's like, oh, maybe you need to install these packages, packages for developing packages. Uh, well, in my case, I already have them, right? Um, then it's like, oh, you maybe want to run the function available from a package called available. What does this do? Well, it, it, it searches the word for your package across a bunch of websites. So for example, like um, it will search it on, um, on um, Urban Dictionary, for example. Uh, and maybe, maybe the word you chose for your package actually, you know, it's a curse word or something, right? Or something you don't want. Um, it also checks whether that package name has been used in Biconductor before and CRAM and other places because you want your, your package name to be unique. Uh, let's say that it is completely unique. Then at that point, you want to create your package using the create package function from um, BioCidus and then you add the templates, right? So that's really the, the create package step. Um, um, and it's a fairly short script, but uh, after that, maybe you want to um, you know, configure your package. So um, these are uh, steps that will help you configure your package um, using uh, use this and bias see this. Um, some of these uh, functions um, ask you whether you want to restart or where you want to do some things. So, um, uh, and uh, the way use this works is that it will show you three different options. One of them is true, two of them are false, and they're always random, so you need to read the messages. Um, but here, like, I'm already starting to, to set up uh, Git uh, for version control in my code. Um, 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 there's some configuration steps you might need to run if this is the first time you've ever done this before on your computer. Um, uh, um, and now at this point, you know, this here in this at this moment, I just created under my GitHub account the mean of this repository for sharing my code. It's empty right now, um, but it, like we created it, um, and now let's let's start filling it up. So that if we if I go to the core files um, the script here. We want to describe how, what is our package, so let's make it into a, um, um, into a biconductor friendly package description. Um, you might want to edit this. Um, so uh, let me move the zoom thing around. But um, um, here, for example, I'm already saying like, okay, let's use the biconductor support website for asking questions. This is automatically where you can find more information about the code. Um, maybe I need to edit my first and last names. Uh, add my email. Um, uh, and I always forget my org ID. Um, let me find it. And maybe you need to describe what the package does. So this will be like, uh, all right. So at this point, I can already like describe a little bit what this package does. This will be, you know, very specific to you, to whatever you're working on. Um, then I can be like, oh, I want to read me uh, explaining my package. Um, and so this automatically uh, builds a template that describes how your package can be done, how it can be cited, all those things. Um, um, there's a lot of text there. That's why I'm like 
going through it fast just because I want to see the end result, which is the documentation website. Um, once I have a readme, you can edit it a bit. Um, um, and at this point, I'm going to use uh, uh, dev tools to, to actually um, uh, uh, create the render version of that readme file. Um, 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 and so that is actually running a new version of R behind scenes and updating that file. Um, we can then also say like, oh, let's describe what changed in our package using the news file. Uh, we can add a code conduct, information about how to contribute to the package, information for people how to ask for help, um, information when they're actually asking for help, what is, it, what are, what is the information you want them to provide. Um, maybe you also want to use um, uh, specific citation information. So here, like I have a template for using like by archive because you're potentially going to submit your package to a preprint. Um, um, maybe you also want to label your package as experimental. Uh, you want to maybe have a little label that says what is how is it actually running on by conductor on those test results from Mac, Windows, and Linux. Um, and then next, you want to maybe um, actually use the GitHub Actions workflow that I uh, that BioCDs contains. Um, 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 oh, sorry, this is just a, a little bag batch, just the, the label. Um, um, then maybe you also want to use test that for testing your package. You can make an example test. Um, here is just saying like two, two two times two should be four, um, based on uh, on the math. Um, um, then maybe you also want to check how well our functions are tested when we want to update our readme um, at this point, potentially, because we have a new citation file, a new, um, um, another information about what this package is doing. Then later on, maybe you want to have an introduction vignette to our package. So this will create the template. It creates a bunch of directories and files in the specific locations that they need to be. Um, and so this is a lot of work that, sure, you can you know, find someone else's package, copy paste, find the, the things that are useful from theirs uh, versus what you want. Um, uh, but uh, having a template is, that also, is faster here. Um, and, like my template explains, for example, how to actually install the package, then what is the required knowledge for using the package, or you can ask for help, and then how to cite the package. And then at that point, then I recommend then explaining how to actually use the package. Um, um, so that's a lot of like, um, you know, work um, that is already simplified by using that template. Here we can finally use the GitHub Actions workflow. So this will copy the file where it needs to be. Um, and then we can edit it, for example, if needed. Um, um, so at this point, because we're using version control, uh, let's, we need to actually uh, save all the changes. So our studio has this um, GitHub interface. So I'm gonna save all those changes here. Um, by using uh, Command A or Control A if you're on Windows. I can select all the files. I'll click here on the left on the box. I will be like, yes, I want to version control all these files. So this will be initial. Um, uh, you need to have like a little descriptive message of what you did. So I'll make a commit at this point. Um, so that way, all my change, all my files and, and things I've done are protected. Uh, and in particular, they're protected in case we start messing with uh, GitHub branches, which is what this package down uh, function will do. That's why there's this big warning. You should always um, commit before running this next step. Um, and so what this will do is that it's gonna create the documentation website for the package. Um, um, so it's actually creating all that, you know, all that fancy HTML. Um, 
is using the template that we have for our code of conduct for how to contribute to the package for how to ask for help um, um, and then he tried installing it but then actually there was an error here because i haven't installed the mean of this package in my computer and so i forgot to do that um, so i'll go, go to um, um, i'll go to build over here on the rc menu click install and restart uh, so this is actually on the top right. You can see that it's installing the min of this package on my computer. Um, after it finished installing on the console on the bottom left, R is uh, restarting. Um, now min of this is a package that I have uh, on my computer. And uh, we need that in order to then make the documentation website. So I'll run that command again. Um, um, so it's making all that um, documentation all those you know, fancy looking files. Um, and this will you know, take a couple more seconds to run. Um, and uh, uh, it, act, if I, it actually uh, up uploaded changes to github.com. So if I refresh this page over here, we'll notice now that um, there's actually the GitHub Pages branch now being publicly available uh, with all the files for that documentation website. Um, if I go to the Git tab, um, 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 I think I forgot to push um, um, to load the basic files. So let me refresh this. Um, so now there's two branches. There's a GitHub Pages branch and the master branch. Um, the master branch here has all those, like um, all the code for our package. Um, uh, but, well, really all the structure for our uh, package. Um, we don't actually have any functions yet. Uh, um, so, um, the last development script here is the update package one. So let's say you, we actually have a function. Um, uh, maybe let me let me just create that fast. So I'll be I'll use use this use R. Um, let's call it um, hello. That will be my function hello. Um, so hello here will be a function. Uh, that will take an argument x and what we'll do will be is it will paste hello that's what my function will do it's a fairly simple function if i want to document it i'm going to use the rstudio uh, magic wand here to then insert roxygen skeleton which is um, um alt shift command r which is a very long keyboard shortcut so I don't never I never remember it. So I always go to the magic wand, and that will in, uh, introduce like um, some examples here of how to um, document this. So I'll be like, um, say hi. Um, and we can describe what are the. Inputs we require for our function. Um, we can add an example. Um, so at this point, I have the function. But let's say um, I'm going to mess my code a little bit. I'm going to use single quotes here. Um, and I'm going to remove that space. Uh, I did those things just because if we go to the update um, script, one of the things that we'll do is it uses the styler package to automatically style your code. Why do you want to do that? You want to do that such that your code is. Um, 
uh, if you're especially if you're working on a team, you want to use uh, to use a consistent coding style and to make it easier for other people to read your code. And so you'll notice that my my function that initially said paste single quotes hello comma x without spaces got changed to using double quotes and now added a little space after the comma. The double quotes versus single quotes is really like not really that important right now. But the space really is because it's trying to separate the logical steps of what's happening. And space is like air uh, for code. It's for when you're like breathing. And it's, it gives you um, room to breathe when you're reading someone else's code. Um, um, and so there's, you know, there's, this package does a lot more stuff than what I just demonstrated right now, the Styler package. But um, um, it will really help people uh, that are working on the same team have a consistent coding style. Um, and so maybe you need to style a bunch of other files too. Like uh, maybe you need to style the development code that I wrote, the vignettes, for example, your README. Um, and so this is something you might want to do many times. Uh, so every time you make an update to one of your files. Maybe also you want to update all the documentation files. So this DevTools document will do that. And here it actually automatically made a hello help file, which is a .rv file. Um, and maybe you want to also update your readme file. Um, um, so these are all steps maybe you want to do frequently every time you're updating your package. Um, um, and so at this point, let me make a commit here. Um, and I'm going to select everything and say add hello function. Uh, and then I'm going to load the changes using push to GitHub. And once I do this, if I go to GitHub, um, uh, you'll notice now that um, the master branch has a new update called add hello function. And if we go to actions, um, uh, well, still running the, the tests using the initial package configuration. Um, uh, uh, but it should also be running the, um, the hello one. Anyway, um, um, I did this in a little bit slightly different order than I've done this before because I pushed the GitHub pages branch before the master branch. Maybe that's why um, uh, my hello update didn't trigger a new action. But the idea is that every time you make an update, you'll get a new action here. Um, and then the action itself is going to update the documentation website. So uh, many of this, the documentation for, for it already exists at uh, my username.github.io forward slash the repository name, which I called many of this. And so this was done you know, automatically. Um, and we can update it automatically now. And you can see now that the vignette structure that I was describing, how it actually looks at for the end user, right? That's why I didn't highlight as much how everything looked then, because um, uh, you know, what you want really is this end result. Um, and right now, at this point, there are no help files for functions because we just made a hello function, so it needs to run some of this code and uh, on before you can update the website. Uh, we can see here like the news file, which documents one of the things we've, we've uh, the features or bugs that we've uh, fixed over the years. Um, uh, if you go to the home website, we can find here like the code of conduct uh, for our package, um, uh, the contributing guide for people if they want to help us out, what they need to do. Um, um, then uh, they, maybe they want to ask for help. They can do this at the supportbioconductor.org website. We have a license that is compatible with the licenses we've used in the past for Bioconductor. Uh, if they want to cite the package, here's the information about how they can cite it. Who are the authors? The link to my uh, org ID, for example. Um, 
So all these little pieces of files that make an R package and make it look nice and all of this and make it such that you can uh, automatically test it um, are really built on top of many, uh, many packages. And BioCD just makes it easier for you to run all these tests. Um, so with that, let me end recording. Uh,